20 years ago, our world almost came crashing down. Financial markets were preparing for an economic meltdown. Countries around the globe were bracing for a worldwide shutdown, all because of a bug. The bug was a computer error. Experts had warned about it for years. Called the year 2000 problem, or Y2K, it threatened to bring our newly computerized civilization to its knees. That's not what happened, of course. So was it overblown, or did a handful of concerned scientists and a multi-billion dollar preventative effort save us from digital Armageddon? Depends on who you ask, and we might never truly know. But here's how the Y2K bug was beaten, or not. In 1993, Computer World magazine became one of the first harbingers of the Y2K apocalypse. It published an article titled Doomsday 2000, and it focused on a computer glitch that at first glance seems laughably minor. The year in a lot of computer programs was missing the first two digits, so 1993 would be recorded as 93. Programmers did this to save money. In the early days of computer programming, memory was at a premium. Disk space could cost upwards of $100 per kilobyte, so programmers were under pressure to reduce the amount of memory the programs took up. One cost-cutting measure they discovered was reducing a four-digit year to only two digits. Even though the price of memory went down and computer space opened up to accommodate the full four digits of the calendar year, this shorthand persisted in programs all over the world from defense department computers to power utilities to toasters. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if the 20th century never ended, but it did. And at the time of the article, the century only had seven short years left. Soon, it would be the year 2000, and any software still using this programming shorthand would record the year as 00. zero. This could wreak havoc with the program in unexpected ways, causing data loss, software errors, or even render a computer unusable. Credit cards could stop working, bank records could vanish, vital services like air traffic control, power utilities, hospitals, and national defense systems could fail. Much of the information processing infrastructure of the world could crumble. The internet itself, barely out of the digital womb, could be snuffed out. Hence Doomsday 2000. The article singled out over 8,000 affected programs. It took the author 10 weeks to identify them all, and there were undoubtedly more out there still unaccounted for. Fixing the Y2K bug would require the cooperation of corporations, governments, and institutions from around the globe. It would take a painstaking amount of effort to fix or replace every single piece of faulty software. It would cost billions, and they only had seven years to do it. Right away, the Y2K bug was accused of being blown out of proportion. The author of the article and the media frenzy that latched onto it were accused of scaremongering. Other computer scientists said it wouldn't be that big of a deal and not worth the extraordinary cost of fixing. Nevertheless, an estimated $600 billion globally was invested in the correction of the Y2K bug. And when the clock turned to midnight on December 31st, 1999, civilization didn't collapse. A few problems did arise though. In Japan, alarms sounded outside a nuclear power plant and radiation monitoring equipment failed. Thermostats malfunctioned in an apartment complex in South Korea. In Australia, bus ticket machines crashed. In the US, lottery machines failed in Delaware. And a few other software errors were reported around the world, all of them relatively minor. So did all the effort to stop the Y2K bug succeed? Or was it a minor problem from the very beginning, blown out of proportion by scaremongers, scam artists, and the media? This conundrum could be compared to the prevention paradox in public health. It goes like this. In health situations, preventing a sickness or injury is nearly always better than treatment after the fact. Prevention is easier, often cheaper, and your quality of life is markedly better. But preventative measures are often hard to implement, despite evidence showing that they are remarkably effective. One reason for this is that once you prevent a malady from happening, it creates an absence of incidents because you averted the danger in the first place. And without a tangible incident to pin your success on, it can look like your preventative measures were at best unnecessary and at worst, a gross overreaction and a waste of money. So a lot of commentary at the time treated the Y2K problem as an overreaction. Looking back on it with 20 years of hindsight, it seems silly how worked up we were about Y2K. People hoarded food and water, the National Guard was on standby, financial markets prepared for an economic crash but nothing happened. And all that probably was an overreaction. That's because the world had begun fixing the Y2K problem in earnest seven years earlier. Most of the offending software had been upgraded or replaced by the time the clock rolled over midnight. There's really no way to know for sure. 
therein lies the paradox. To know for sure that the Y2K bug was actually worth all the time and effort to prevent, we'd have to skew those preventative measures and let the Y2K problem play out, which could result in an unmitigated disaster of global proportions. But as it happens, the Y2K problem will remain an absence of incidents, all because we erred on the side of caution. Special thanks to our Patreon patrons. Without you, the good stuff just wouldn't happen. So if you like what we do here, go on over to patreon.com slash thegoodstuff and become a supporter. Otherwise, you can like and subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell so you know when the next video is coming out, and I'll be back in a couple weeks with a new video. Thanks for watching.